a bit like the Arctic with all that ice. All those ridges and cracks. This is Europa. And maybe, like the Arctic, this ice is floating on water. Liquid water. It's an intriguing thought. But we're 800 million kilometers from the sun. Surely Europa is frozen solid. Unless Jupiter's gravity is creating friction deep inside, stopping Europa from freezing solid, allowing life to develop in the waters beneath its frozen crust. We might be meters away from aliens. From a whole ecosystem of microbes, crustaceans, maybe even squid. The only thing between us and the possibility of alien life, this layer of ice. But until we send a spacecraft to drill through the ice, Europa will remain one of the solar system's greatest mysteries. It's captivated our imaginations, haunted our dreams. And here it is, spinning before our eyes. Saturn, the jewel in the solar system's crown. Seeing it makes everything we've experienced worthwhile. There's something magical about Saturn. A giant ball of gas, so light it would float on water. Its spectacular rings would stretch almost from Earth to the moon, but they're just a few hundred meters deep. That's the Cassini orbiter. It's picking up ghostly radio emissions, probably generated by auroras around Saturn's poles. This is the real music of the spheres. And Cassini is telling us these rings are probably all that's left of a moon shattered by Saturn's gravitational pull. Incomparable beauty from total destruction. Billions of shards of ice, some as small as ice cubes. Others the size of houses. They collide, break apart, reassemble. It's like a snapshot of our early solar system. As dust and gas orbited the newly born sun and gravity worked its magic. Pulling the lumps together until from debris like this, our home emerged. We could stay here forever, gazing at Saturn's seductive allure. But we have to drag ourselves away. We've got so much further to go, so much more to learn. Which isn't easy when the largest object in sight is this moon, wrapped in thick clouds. Titan. like there's an atmosphere down here. There's wind, rain, even seasons. And look at these rivers, lakes and oceans. It's the most similar place to Earth we've seen so far. Maybe it was worth tearing ourselves away from Saturn after all. Except that's not water. That's liquid natural gas. There must be hundreds of times more natural gas here than all the Earth's oil and gas reserves. 
If we could get it home, it could power our cities, fuel our cars for thousands of years. Or maybe, one day, we could use it here to fuel a colony. Assuming there isn't life on Titan already. The Huygens space probe, dropped onto Titan's surface from Cassini, is here to find out. It's telling us there are organic materials in the soil. But it's so cold, minus 180 degrees. There's no way these could come together to form life. Unless Titan warms up. The sun is predicted to get hotter. When it does, maybe life will spring up here, just like it did on Earth billions of years ago. As the Earth gets too hot for us, maybe we'll move to Titan. One day we might call this distant place home. Home. We're at least a billion kilometers away now. Beyond this point, we lose visual contact with the Earth. We're standing on a cliff, looking out into the solar system's mysterious outer reaches. If we want to understand the universe, to reach its edge, we have to jump. Unseen from Earth, unknown for most of history, we're in the solar system's outer reaches. It's like diving down into the deep ocean. Those rings. It looks like Uranus has been tilted off its axis, toppled over by a stray planet. It's eerie out here. Already beginning to feel small, lonely. Maybe this is how we'll feel, what we'll find at the edge of the universe. But we've barely left the shore. Shrink the Earth down to the size of a pea, we've traveled less than two kilometers. But to reach the edge of the solar system, we've got to travel another 20,000 kilometers. Out of the deep, another strange beast. The god of the sea, Neptune. This giant is swathed in methane gas. And look, a storm the size of Earth whipped up by savage 1,500 kilometer an hour winds. Back home, it's the sun that drives the wind, but Neptune's too far away. Something else must be creating these ferocious winds, but nobody knows what. Our solar system is huge. It's alarming how little we really know about it. Plunging deeper, something to cling to. After all those balls of gas, a solid moon. Triton. Solid, but not stable. Just look at these geysers, cosmic chimneys pumping out strange soot. And this moon is going round Neptune in the opposite direction to the planet's spin. A cosmic battle of wills that this angry moon is always going to lose. Neptune's massive gravity is pulling on Triton, slowing it down, reeling it in. One day, it'll be ripped apart by Neptune. And that's it. No more moons, no more planets to see in our solar system. It's getting colder, 
were getting further from the sun, slipping from the grip of its gravitational tentacles. But look at all this. It's not a void. It's teeming with frozen rocks. Icy spheres. Like Pluto. Until recently, it seemed Pluto was alone. Beyond it, nothing. We were wrong. More frozen worlds. Discoveries so new, nobody can agree what to call them. Plutinos, ice dwarfs, cubuanos. Whatever the name, the implications are the same. Our solar system is in the neat model we thought it was. Over 13 billion kilometers from home, the most distant thing ever seen to orbit the sun, another small icy world called Sedna, discovered in 2003. Its orbit takes 10,000 years and sends it 130 billion kilometers from the sun. Hang on, there's something else out here. 16 billion kilometers from home, the space probe Voyager 1. If it wasn't for this bundle of aluminium and antennae, we'd have no images of the giant planets, no clue about their strange moons. It's traveling 20 times faster than a bullet, sending messages home. And look, on its side, that gold panel, a kind of intergalactic message in a bottle. There's a greeting recorded in different languages. And a map showing how to find our solar system. But if you're in the jungle, is it wise to call out? Anyone, anything could hear our call, find out where we live and come knocking, friendly or not. A cloud of cosmic icebergs stretching for what seems like forever. They look like the comet we saw earlier. Maybe it started life out here, until something dislodged it, sending it towards the sun just like the comets that may have planted life on Earth billions of years ago. And seeing all this ice, maybe they carried water to Earth too. It's an astonishing thought. The water in the oceans, in your coffee, even in your body, all from this distant celestial ice machine. We're eight million, million. That's eight trillion kilometers from home. But in reality, this is only a baby step. Ahead, trillions of kilometers, billions of stars. This is it. Time to stop looking in and start looking out. To step out into the big, wide universe. Into interstellar space. Interstellar space, far beyond our solar system. What a view. Billions of stars like our own sun, many with planets, many of those with moons. It's hard to know which way to go. There are infinite possibilities in every direction. Whichever way, we're going to need a serious burst of acceleration. trillion kilometers from home. A 150,000 year ride in a space shuttle. 
and we've only just reached the first solar system after our own. Alpha Centauri. Not one, but three stars. They're spinning around each other, locked in a celestial standoff. Each star's gravity attracting the other, their insane orbital speed keeping them apart. Get between them, and we could be flung into the face of one of these stars. Vaporized, trillions of kilometers from home. So far, the kilometers are becoming meaningless. We're going to have to talk in light years. A beam of light takes one year to travel 10 trillion kilometers. So 40 trillion kilometers is four light years from home. It's crazy. Distances so vast, they're almost beyond comprehension. And exciting. Who knows what strange worlds lie ahead? What we'll discover when? If we reach the edge of the universe. Ten light years from Earth, the star Epsilon Eridani. What spectacular rings of dust and ice, and somewhere in there, planets forming out of the debris, being born before our eyes. Asteroids and comets everywhere. We could almost be looking at our own solar system billions of years ago, with comets delivering organic molecules, water to these young planets, kick-starting life, just as they may have done on Earth. At the center of all this action, a star smaller than our sun. It's still in its infancy. Any life in this solar system would be primitive at best. There must be more mature, developed solar systems out here. But finding them is like looking for a needle in a cosmic haystack. Twenty light years from Earth. Star Gliese 581. It's about the same age as our sun. And orbiting it, this planet. It's just the right distance from its sun. Any closer and water would boil away. Any further and it would freeze. Ideal conditions for life to have evolved. And if comets have struck, delivering water and organic materials, then life, complex beings like us, even civilizations like our own, could be down there right now. And if there are, even at this distance, they could be tuning into our TV signals, watching shows from 20 years ago. And here's your host, Joe Jackman. But until future generations can find a way of communicating over these vast distances, all we can do is speculate. Us and them, living parallel lives, unaware of each other's existence. Unless life has been and gone. That's the problem.
them with comets. They're creators and destroyers. As the dinosaurs found out the hard way 65 million years ago. This is the needle in the cosmic haystack, the closest we've come to a habitable solar system like our own. But it's a chance encounter. There could be hundreds, millions more solar systems like this out here, or none at all. This is vast. And look, it's the planet Bellerophon. So close to its own sun, it's a miracle it was discovered at all. Problem is, from Earth, we can't see planets this far out. They're obscured by the brilliance of their neighboring stars. But the planets have a minute gravitational pull on those stars. Measure these tiny movements trillions of kilometers away, and we can prove they exist. That's how we tracked down Bellerophon in the 1990s. Opening the floodgates to the discovery of hundreds of other distant planets. <laughs> 65 light years from Earth. Tune in on this bright star and you'd pick up TV signals from Hitler's Berlin Olympics. Twin stars. It's Algol, the demon star feared since ancient times on account of its sinister behavior. From Earth, it appears to blink as one star passes in front of the other. Up close, it's even stranger. One star has expanded into the gravitational pull of the other. It's being sucked towards it. Almost a hundred light years from home, listen. One of the first ever radio broadcasts, just a faint whisper. silence. From here on out, it's as if Earth never existed. Any aliens living beyond here will have no idea we're there. It feels like a lifetime ago we stood on that beach, looking up at the sky, wondering where and how we fitted in. It's time to appreciate the wonders we're seeing, not just for what they tell us about our own world, it's what they can tell us about the whole universe, its past and its future. Deep inside our galaxy, the Milky Way, a vast celestial library, each star a book with a story to tell. It's all here, waiting for us to lift the cover. The seven sisters, daughters of the ancient Greek god Atlas, transformed into stars to comfort their father as he held the heavens on his shoulders. And this giant, Betelgeuse. The brightest, biggest star we've seen so far. It's got to be at least 600 times wider than our own sun. But this, it's not a star. Not a planet, not like anything we've ever seen. A ghostly specter, more than 1300 light years from Earth. Orion's dark cloud. Dust and gas, so dense it's shrouding us. 
shutting us off from the universe outside. There, deep inside, a ball of light, pulling the dust and gas towards it, heating up, merging into a ball of burning hot gas. Like a star, like our sun, in miniature. It's millions of degrees inside it, so hot it's beginning to trigger nuclear reactions, the kind that keep our sun shining, making energy, radiation, light. A star is being born. Or rather, stars. Orion's dark cloud is a vast star factory. We're witnessing the birth of the future universe. We've come to expect hostile horrors, but we're discovering one of the universe's greatest creative wonders, star birth. Perhaps we spoke too soon. Jets of gas exploding outwards at 200,000 kilometers an hour. Blasting dust and gas out for millions of kilometers. It's unbelievably violent, but look at the results. It's beyond words. Nebula, vast glowing clouds of gas hanging in space. With no wind out here, they'll take thousands of years to disperse. They seem to be forming a vast stellar sculpture. It makes you realize nature is more than a scientist, an engineer. It's an artist on the grandest of scales. We've seen some strange sights, but this is a masterpiece. A giant horse's head rearing up in space. Stars are born grow up, and then, then what? Do they die? Do they slip quietly into the night, or go out with a bang? Somewhere between here and the edge of the universe lies the answer. Nearly 4,000 light years further, luminous clouds suspended in space encircling what was once a star like our own sun. All that's left of it are these brightly colored gases. Elements formed by nuclear fusion deep inside the star released into space on its death. Green and violet, hydrogen and helium, the raw materials of the universe. Red and blue, nitrogen and oxygen, the building blocks of life on Earth. For us to live, stars like this had to die. The oxygen in our lungs, the nitrogen in our DNA, it was all produced by nuclear fusion in stars that died long before the Earth was even born. We are made of stellar nuclear waste. Our family tree begins here.
at its heart, the ghost of a star. It's a white dwarf. White, hot, small, but unbelievably dense. In the star's dying moments, its atoms fused and squeezed together, making it so dense that just a teaspoon of this white dwarf would weigh one ton. It's a chilling premonition of our sun's fate. Six billion years from now, it'll become a white dwarf. Its death will herald the end of life on Earth. It makes you wonder how many other worlds have been and gone. Stories left untold. Celestial books lost forever. But the greatest story of them all is still to be told. We must go back through time to the very first chapter to tell the story of how the universe began. scattered remains of a dead star, a nebula, the Crab Nebula. We're 6,000 light years from home, deep inside a stellar graveyard. We've learned so much, seen things we'd never have believed possible. Now sights like this, wonders once beyond imagination, we take in our stride. We're ready, ready to face whatever lies ahead, determined to reach the edge of the universe. It looks dead, but maybe this is just the calm after the storm, after a massive explosion, powerful enough to turn a huge star into a cloud of dust and gas, a supernova. storm, a spinning, pulsating star, a pulsar. Gravity must have squeezed the giant star's core down to this. It's just 20 kilometers across, unimaginably dense. One pinhead of this would weigh hundreds, maybe millions of tons. As it shrank, like a figure skater spinning on the spot, arms outstretched, then pulling them in, it began to spin faster. Two beams of light, energy, radiation, spinning 30 times a second, powering the huge cloud of dust and gas. There's so much radiation here, more even than on the sun. That was easily the deadliest thing we've encountered so far. Once, it would have terrified us. But now we realize that without the dangers, there'd be no wonders. Without the nightmares, there'd be no dreams. 